Uh, so here, I'm gonna run through a bunch of stuff and then hopefully leave us time to dialogue because this is about us talking together, not about me talking to you. Uh, so, okay, one of the things we wanna talk about is civic tech. There's some other things we can talk about too. I'll tell you a little bit about me so you know who's working for you. Uh, and I'd like to tell you about the first six months of been in the job, what that's been like. And I'd like to share some opportunities for us to work together and hear more ideas from you about the same, right? All right, so let's start with some introductions. I'm a redneck from the streets of Chicago in the hinterlands of Wisconsin who's had a lover's quarrel with technology in the digital sense for about 40 years. Uh, given the zeitgeist, let's start with an old dead white guy poem I read a lot in those North Woods. This is some Robert Frost from Two Tramps in Mud Time, okay? So, but yield who will to their separation, my object in living is to unite, my avocation and my vocation, as my two eyes make one in sight. Only where love and need are one, and the work is play for mortal stakes, is the deed ever really done for heaven and the future's sakes. So that's a lot, right? But he's talking about trying to put his calling and his work together, right? And so I've had a lot of jobs trying to unite those two. Let me tell you, it's not easy, right? So partial list. Stock boy, shoe salesperson, poet, screen printer, line cook, dishwasher, guitarist, waiter, reporter, bouncer, apprentice, luthier, front end designer, information architect, interaction designer, experience designer, adjunct professor, mentor, design director, vice president of product, managing partner, CEO, board member, and dad. I'm gonna let her catch up. All right, so I worked at startup, she's quick. I worked at startups like Orbitz, was on the founding team of The Point, which grew up to be Groupon, was the first director of UX and product in a presidential campaign at Obama for America 2012, founded Public Good, one of the first benefit software corporation startups, and now I'm in municipal government, okay? So I've been a rolling stone, right? I've been trying to roll from place to place to figure out where I can combine my calling and my skill to create impact. And, you know, I left VC-backed startups in particular because I think the culture is fundamentally broken, right? And design's role has been bastardized and fundamentally needs some realignment, right? It's common practice, oh, page three, uh, to treat people like pulp for your growth model, right? And that's a big shift. It used to be about user experience, actually empowering people through technology. Now what Facebook and others are doing is using behavioral psych hacks and physiological triggers to manipulate precognitive human behavior for profit. And that reads like some bullshit from a William Gibson novel, not like what we should be doing to each other, right? <clears throat> I wish Zuckerberg had read some Frost. Hell, I wish he'd read some Stan Lee's Spider-Man, right? With great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> He's starting to figure it out now. It's good, right? So, but now we're talking about it, and that means we can figure out ways to change it. So let's talk, you know, civic tech in particular for a second, right? Like 2012 in Chicago was a very different time, right? We all were on this kind of high. We saw you know, 300 hack nights ago, this community was starting. And, you know, we saw the power of tech with OFA 2012 and the failure of tech with healthcare.gov. And that inspired government heroics and communities to get out and vote. We saw the philanthropic space wake up to the potential of funding startups and tech that can help people in kind of, you know, the social enterprise space. And we saw GAFM, do you all know GAFM, right? Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, wake up to the power of organizing theory and social science, right? So it's seven years later, give or take, how'd we do, right? Who's doing the best out of those groups now, right? And what does the best even mean? So I wonder a lot about that as a newly minted government employee, you know? Should we be building teams, leveraging open source more, buying products from Google? Does it matter how municipalities provide services, right? I mean, my job is just to make sure that they work well, right? And look good when people are using them. Does it matter where they come from? What if Google shuts down Sidewalk Labs in the same way they did Google Reader, right? What do the people in Google Town do when their infrastructure is sunset, right? So out of all those different players, I'm telling you right now, I'm here to say the one I'm betting on is you, right? Uh, we still as citizens and residents actually have the most power to impact our community and to make choices about the technology and products we use. And so, you know, that's why I decided to join uh, the government, right? So here, I'm gonna skip some of this because it gets to be a diatribe. We'll, we'll go a page down. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, so, okay, so enough about that. Uh, let's talk design for a second. So my friend Howell Malham says design is intentional deviance, right? You find the norm, you subvert the norm, you watch the fireworks, right? If they're beautiful, you're onto something. And if it's a dud, you gotta redo, right? And that's how it works. 
So it's evolution, basically, right? Intentional evolution, that's what design is. It's us as tool making creatures trying to figure out better tools, better ways for us to adapt our environment to be more pleasant for us, right? So for that to work in any real way, you need a culture that supports it, right? So we talk a lot in design about process, 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 but process sits on culture, right? So what does your team value? What are your people who are working for your team? What do they value? What are their shared experiences? What are their unshared experiences? What are their expectations? All that stuff gets baked in, right? So culture begets process, process makes product. The product then embodies that process and culture, right? So when people feel it, when they use that product, and that's, that's not me, that's like a Christopher Alexander. So there's one thing you take from this talk, uh, go read his notes in the synthesis of form, he's absolutely right. The process that makes the product is felt in the product, right? Anyway, so there's that. Throw a couple other things out there for you. I'm a real Kaizen fanboy. I don't know if anybody else here is into Kaizen, but the whole notion, right? Small questions, small thoughts, small actions, small problems, small rewards, small moments, consistently applied, create massive change, right? So, uh, so that's that. So basically to create cultural change, you find good people doing good things, you do good work with them, you model that behavior for others, they see you having success with that behavior, that behavior changes the culture, and then you're starting to work in a different way, right? So those are my keys, basically. A apply some intentional deviance to your culture process and product through small steps to produce, or to reduce fear and risk, and make sure you do that with all the different voices that you have within your team, so that you're not trying to railroad people down into your cultural set of assumptions, but you're broadening your scope and you're broadening what the team actually considers as, as part of their work. All right, that's part two. I'll stop blatting here in a second and we can get down to business. All right, so let's get down into the work. I've been at the city of Chicago now for 149 days. That's about 40,000 people across 29 departments in the third largest metro in the US. I am the sole designer for digital services in a newly created position, thanks to the vision of Danielle Dumer, who's in the audience tonight. Uh, for most of those days, I've basically done a bunch of stuff that we can't share yet because it's not yet released, which is weird to say as a city employee, but we'll, we can talk about that. Uh, and the other thing that I really did a lot of was just listened. Uh, for about 180 days, I didn't really do a lot of work. I just tried to listen to the way we did work. And you know, you still try to fit in and actually, I, I did stuff, Danielle, really honestly. There were things that happened. Uh, it's in a progress report. But no, but a lot of it was really listening, right? Because it's, uh, it's not a startup, right? It's a 180 year old institution that has a lot of good reasons for why it does things and a lot of good reasons for why things need to change drastically, right? And those two things often exist in the same room and in the same meeting. And so you can't just show up and say, hey, like guns blazing, oh, let's change this stuff like a startup guy. It's not how it works, right? So let's talk about how it does work, right? At the city, I'm focused on those same things, culture, process, product, right? And those are expressed really as three kind of design themes. One is design literacy, two is a design system, and three is the design of services, okay? So what does all that mean? Well, like in the 20th century, right, we use like law and analog systems to like implement equality, right, through bureaucracy. And it got really unequally applied. Right, but it was the best we could do because we didn't have digital systems to keep track of how things were going. You know? Now it's different. Right? We live in an information and an attention economy that means that we all can figure out how a lot of stuff is going. Actually, probably more stuff than you even want to know. Right? So that changes fundamentally the way in which we deliver products and services and the way in which we engage with people. And that's part of the reason why I was hired, right? just to create basically a conduit between the city of Chicago, its residents, and its visitors and its businesses, and how do we start to create meaningful dialogue about the ways in which our products and services actually help or hinder people to get access to them, right? So that's that. Uh, so yeah, I already told you we're not a startup, so you got that part done. Oh, we'll go, I'll give you this line. So this is a weird one, right? Our, our aims are not insanely great, which is what you always hear in the startup world, right? It's actually like mostly adequate and to the statute, which has been, it's been hard to get used to, but it's also really where the focus of the work should be, right? Because it's ultimately not our goal to actually like nail products and services and to crush the market or whatever, you know, weird things people say in startup land. Uh, it's our goal to drive as many services to as many people who need them and meet them where they need them, right? And so it's a very different set of goals. So mostly adequate and to the statute actually means 
we're getting as much stuff that does the job into as many people's hands as possible in a way that makes the biggest impact we can in their lives, right? So that's that. Uh, I got more to say on that one, but I'll leave it off the page for you. All right, let's move on a little bit. So design systems. Anybody here know what a design system is? A couple folks, right? Okay, cool, right? So they're kind of old news, but if, if you don't know, it's like basically, it's the equivalent of a digital online lookbook that helps you figure out both behavior, voice, tone, and look for the products and services you're shipping, okay? Uh, kind of table stakes. Again, if you're in like the startup world or even like an 18F or USDS, you know, you see that they already have some of these things kind of, you know, built uh, or built out a little bit more. Uh, we didn't really have a lot of standards. We had some from our graphic design department. So I want to be real clear about something, like timeout. I'm not the first design director the city ever had. I'm the first one focused on digital products and experiences, right? So we have a guy who makes posters and business cards and like he's got a team and he's wonderful and they're great, but they don't do this stuff. And because they're great, they never created a style guide. They just knew what they did and they just did it, which is awesome for them. But for us, we have a lot of different partners we work with. We have about 200 applications and a bunch of different teams that produce them, both city teams as well as vendor teams. We needed a design system. So that's where we're heading with that. So our stuff, we're really deriving from two places. One is the historical record. We've got 180 years of awesome typographic and visual design experience here in the city, all these crazy assets. We've got a great flag. We've got all this cool stuff. Also, uh, we have 18F and USDS and all the stuff that they've been producing. So we don't have to start from scratch. We can start from 90% of scratch, take our design stuff, and add the things that make us unique as a city. And the way in which we're doing that is actually to uh, keep that open source and to keep that completely open and ideally do it in a way that other cities could pick up that work and run with it, right? Like one of the reasons why I came here aside from just making sure we get better accessibility and usability in our stuff is because, you know, in an age of kind of creeping federal authoritarianism, it's not a bad thing to strengthen cities. Uh, so if you're interested in working on that, let me know. Uh, not the authoritarianism, but the, the design system, right? <laughs> the authoritarian, they'll be next week, actually. They're going to be coming in. Um, but yeah, so the current system uh, is like, you know, because we're new, new team, team of one, uh, it's basically the work of, of a grad student, Tate Chamberlain, who couldn't be here. He's wonderful. Hire him. His internship is over. Uh, Lucas Hoffman, who had to go back to high school, and, and uh, Derek Hunter Ramos, who's in the audience tonight, so give him a big hand because he's been working for you for free. So we would love your help with that. We'd love to hear how we can make a design system useful for you. We would love to hear how there's ways that we can collaborate with you. We could, would love to figure out ways for us to make this better so that our city is more accessible and usable to everybody, right? Okay, so that's that. So then third thing I wanted to get real about what we're doing as well. So we're going to chat about a particular product we're working on. We are redesigning the 311 system, uh, which handles about 4 million requests per year for about 400 plus service types. Okay. Somebody's excited. That's awesome. Love it. Uh, okay. Speak up a little bit of both. Okay. Uh, so real quick, this summer we kicked off the first resident engagement sessions in at least a decade in the city. Right. So just, trying to get in touch with residents and figure out what they're thinking about. And here's what we learned. Uh, about a third of residents use it, a third of residents know about it but gave up on it, and a third don't know, right? So uh, metrics-wise, you know, we're looking at about 100 different metrics we're tracking, and I'm sure they'll all show up in reports somewhere, but right now I care about one as a design director because I try to focus, right? Constraints, big design thing, you got to say that in every design talk. Constraints. Okay, we got that done. Here's what we're focusing on. Right? Can we get more people using it by regaining their trust through radical empathy, vulnerability, transparency, and a willingness to dialogue? Right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Can we convince ultimately people to care because we care? Right? There's a lot of people who are like, hey, I call a lot, I don't get service, I don't care, I'm out. We need to turn that around. Right? It's going to be a hard job, so we're not going to do it again tomorrow, but over time we will get it done. So the rest of those metrics, I'm sure they're important, but like big picture, who cares? We just need to get people believing in 3 on one and using it. Things will be good. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to take this a step further. We, do, we did resident engagement. We want to do more resident engagement. And this is, again, where you come into the picture. 
If you are interested in usability testing or helping with usability testing or accessibility testing, or you have other ideas for how you can get engaged, let me know. I would love to talk with you about that stuff, right? Because again, like team of one, there's like 40,000 people working on these systems. We need all the design help we can get. Uh, design is relatively new for the city uh, in this space, but there's this enormous hunger and this enormous desire within the city to get this right and to do it well and to serve you better. So let's take advantage of that. So uh, that's about it, I guess. I want to give everybody time to talk because, again, I want to answer your questions and I want to talk with you about what your expectations would be, what you think a design director should be doing at the city, and just start the dialogue. Uh, so I'm going to shut up and turn it over to you all. Thank you for your time and thank you for being here. Hey, big fan. This is kind of new. Thank I don't, you. We don't really, I didn't know that this position existed, but I'm super excited about it. Um, I feel like Chicago's got a big brand issue. Uh, I think a lot of the country and internationally feels like Chicago is a place that's violent, has bad weather, and is corrupt. And there's so much more to the story um, and so I'm kind of wondering what your office and colleagues are doing to make a concerted effort to change that perspective, both nationally and, and internationally. Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't, I don't have to repeat it, right? Because you got the mics and the very tech. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, it's, this is intense, right? Like um, we had over a dozen violent deaths in the city last weekend, right? Or two weekends ago. Um, yeah, it's, it's super serious. You know, I think, I mean, the corruption piece, sure. The weather piece, yeah, it's the Midwest. The violence piece, yep, terrible. Um, direct line of sight, like, what do I do day to day and what do people within our team, which is Department of Innovation and Technology, do to address these issues? Uh, well, a couple things. And one, uh, our team actually does some really crazy stuff sometimes in terms of making sure that we understand the problems and issues that our technology is meant to address. So like uh, two weeks ago, we had Tom Shank here, right, who just was the chief data officer, right? One of his last things he did was actually go on a ride along with his team into some of the neighborhoods that their data is being used to do like crime prediction and other work in, right? So just trying to understand contextually we hear what the police are saying, can we also hear what the community are saying, and then can we create solutions and verify the data that we're using in a way that tells a story? Um, I'm not sure I'm going to get right at your question because it's a huge one, but I'll try to answer the parts of it I can, right? Uh, Corruption-wise, I mean, I think a large part of what we're doing with 311 is to address a lot of ways in which uh, good government should work, which is to say that um, the new three-on-one system, it's not just about making a new app for people on the end users to see, like residents. Uh, it's actually for digitizing that entire system so that we can understand how we're actually delivering services and are we delivering services equitably and fairly across the city, right? And, you know, I mean, the answer today is probably no, right? But we don't really know. And so if you don't know consistently at a granular level, we can't really be as active as we want to be about making sure that things are equal. And so one of the hopes for this new system is that we put it in place at the end of the year and we start getting actually a lot more predictive about services and how they're being delivered to people. And we make sure that we're actually doing it in a, a better fashion. Uh, weather, I mean, we haven't done a lot with that. Um, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's another thing. Um, yeah, and there's definitely like a lot of work to do. And I think as far as like overall kind of how we're kind of changing the mission or changing perception kind of nationally. Uh, I would say it's more the responsibility of the mayor's office. That's kind of where that falls traditionally. And they've got a great press team that they've put together who I think are, are working really hard to kind of change that narrative in a lot of ways. And, you know, I, I, think, you're seeing, um, I think you're seeing some results of that, but it's definitely a tough story and it's one that we need to do more to address, right, especially on the violent side. All right, um, we're going to take a question from the doc here next. Yeah. Um, what particular steps are you taking to ensure that the city's tech products are usable by those who are not tech savvy? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, so right now, uh, we are starting our first rounds of usability testing. So we're making sure, like with the product for 3-on-1 that's coming out, that'll be coming out like sometime in December or, like, or early 2019 or something, uh, we're already doing usability testing with that stuff. Uh, and we've actually done a bunch of participatory design. So one of the things I didn't get to is that I'm really lazy. 
Uh, and so I like it better when people design stuff for me. So we've gone out and we did uh, like a dozen uh, participatory design sessions where we actually just went in communities and said, what does the ideal 311 look like for you and how does that work? And then took a lot of those ideas. Um, fortunately, a lot of that stuff is already in the product. So hopefully that'll still keep on, uh, you know, keep on being there. Um, but that's basically it. Like some discovery stuff up front, make sure we're focused on the right stuff. And then some validation stuff in the back end, make sure that the stuff we're producing actually does work. And then I'd say the final thing is once we launch, uh, Civic Tech has kind of been, I call it like, uh, Danielle hates this maybe, I don't know, I hope she doesn't. I call it like launch by trebuchet, right? So like a lot of Civic Tech launches were like, got that out the door, yeah, right? And so that's, we're not gonna do that this time. It's gonna be much more about what are metrics like over time. Uh, the team is in place to keep on changing the product throughout the year. Um, my biggest worry right now, frankly, is accessibility. So we went out to Access Chicago and did a bunch of interviews with folks to hear about the current 3-in-1 experiences. And we're also starting to recruit those folks so that they can actually participate in uh, usability sessions that would probably be remote and using their technology so that they can have the benefit of their assistive technology there. So again, just involving people, just trying to get them in the process at the start at the finish and making sure that we're listening the whole way through. Hi, um, you had a comment about how process and design are related. I think as a designer, um, for those who are designers, we all think of process as the thing that leads to design. And you said something at the start of your talk that really made me think about it in reverse. And it's like, how can design lead to the process? And so as that feedback cycle, how can technology products possibly help to influence the culture of the city services employees and the whole city government in itself to have an organic system that promotes positive behavior, accountability, civic pride, those sort of qualities. So it's just an open-ended thought. I don't really expect an answer. Yeah, no, but that's a good, th thank you for saying it. And I think there's, there's a lot in there, right? Which is, um, so I was just up at uh, Design for America uh, like a week or so ago and, and uh, Dan Pink was one of the speakers, and he was super great. And one of the things he mentioned, he does a, a lot of work on like, um, <clears throat> like motivation and work and things like that. And his thing was that basically the things that motivate anybody from, he did like 10 years of research, and the thing that motivates people are basically uh, really quick, constant feedback on a job that you're doing, and that is showing that you're performing well, and that that job is tied to a mission that has purpose, right? And that you can kind of see the purpose between your feedback and that bigger thing, right? And I think, like at the city, we do sometimes a good job and sometimes a bad job of that, right? We're like, um, I think we, you know, we could do, uh, we do a lot where we use that old kind of model of, hey, we did the thing that the statute says because that's how we make sure service is provided equitably. And sometimes that actually doesn't really square it right, it doesn't actually deliver services in the way that we want, and we often feel that gap as consumers, right, where we're, or residents, where we're like, hey, I called to get my tree trimmed, I never heard back from these people, or whatever the case may be. So I think one of the things, again, not to keep three on one, three on one, but we're really excited about this idea of, um, like one of the things that came out of the design session was people actually said, we wanna get back in touch with the people who did the work. And we were like, oh, cause you wanna complain about the work? And they're like, well, yeah, that, but more, we wanna thank them. Like nobody ever thanks anybody. They fill all these potholes, they do all this stuff, but we never have the opportunity to close the loop and say, hey, job well done. And so I think there's a lot of loops like that we can start to find and hopefully use to reinforce that culture. Hi, um, I was wondering how you see design growing or how you wanna see design growing in your office and like the city government. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, I mean, so design, it's, kind of, it's weird right now, right? So design has always had this kind of uncomfortable seat where for about 10 or 15 years, we all complained, oh, you know, we don't ever get invited to the boardroom. This sucks, like we never get respected, right? And then like suddenly we became product people. And then as product people, we got invited to the boardroom. And then they were like, hey, show us your ROI. And we we're like, what the, f who, what? <laughs> right, I don't wanna, these are numbers, man. I de I, narrative is me, I'm a narrative, you know. So now we're in this weird place, right? And so like for us, um, 
a lot of the way that we got to design system stuff is for me to grow my team, I need to show ROI, right? And the easiest place for me to show ROI was with the design system, right? Let's stop the conversation about how big the button should be and what color red. Let's tell you what red. Let's tell you how the button can look and let's test that with users so that the next project doesn't have to do that stuff, right? So that's the goal. Uh, we've I've started going through the budget process, so first time through it. We're hoping to have good results, but you never know. There's a lot of stuff that the city needs to spend money on, and the city doesn't often have all the money it would like. Uh, make that never has all the money. Um, but that's okay. So we'll figure it out. First year, we're gonna try looking at doing a pod, so getting, getting a little team together. Uh, probably not gonna go to the real uh, high-end stuff. Like we're bringing a little bit of service design, but you gotta meet people where they are. And if they've never used your design services in the past, then it's really hard to go there. Like we've got, they know that we don't do logos, or I don't do logos, right? So it's good. And we're getting into like what wireframes are, and we're getting into ideation sessions, but we're not at a point where we can kind of drop in a service designer on a team and have them run and have them be part of the team because we're still kind of working a lot of this out. So first year, it'll probably be more like usability testing folks, UX writing folks, interaction design, people with the real practical kind of boots on the ground kind of focus. And I think as we start to become more useful, uh, then we'll start to look at adding more to that mix. Yeah. Um, we're gonna take another question from the doc here, which I think is kind of related to your last point there, um, which is what are the best resources or ways for an employee of the city of Chicago rather civic group to introduce the ideas that you presented tonight to their team? Oh, wow. Um, that's a great question. If you are somebody from the city of Chicago, we should talk, because I'd love to work on that with you, because I probably should have done more of that than just listen. Um, I mean, there's, I have a little deck that I put together and I one on one with a lot of the teams, and that seemed pretty helpful. Um, there's also, there are a lot of resources out there around sort of like what is design thinking or things like that. I mean, I think one of the things that's tough about design is that like, you know, you have to sort of define it up front what you mean by it, especially when you get in these really abstract like design thinking type things, right? Cause we don't we do not do a lot of design thinking at the city because we don't have to invent new products, right? Like if you talk to IDEO, like design thinking is basically an innovation strategy to come up with new product ideation. We really don't do that, right? Like not because we don't believe in innovation, but because mostly we know what we need to do. We need to fill potholes faster. We need to like listen to, you know, people through our website and other places, like our service delivery stuff is pretty well known. Again, we're 180 years old. It's not really the role of the city to create amazing new innovative stuff outside of like the kind of big platformy things, like array of things or things like that, where it's a little bit more of like us creating infrastructure for others to do that kind of work. So anyway, I'm kind of rambling off the topic. I guess the point being, uh, whoever asked that question, yeah, let's figure that out together because that would be a really good thing to have. I've used resources and links, and I probably know too much about design at this point to be useful to communicate it on a one-on-one level, um, but there's gotta be a simple way to communicate that value to folks. I guess that's a shitty answer. Oh, sorry, that's a bad answer. Uh, I'll give you the other answer. So I, I explained it to my daughter like this. Uh, I said, it's like a shampoo bottle, right? So like, if you think about it, you know, like lather, rinse, repeat. That's basically what design is, right? You learn some stuff, you have some suppositions, you try it out and you see what happens with it. And then if you don't get it right, you just do it again. And if you get it right, you do it again but with a different problem. I don't know if that made any sense. Yep. Uh, so we have, it sounds like a lot of designers in the audience and a lot of people working on enterprise applications and B2B stuff. I think it might be kind of cool to hear about um, how you've talked about work on a design system and work on the 311 application specifically and hearing how those two things uh, work together, how those two projects are related to each other would be good to hear about. Oh yeah, sure thing. So yeah, so the design system is Derek, me, uh, Tate, and um, oh my God, I'm spacing, it's Lucas, sorry. Um, so it's the four of us basically kind of cranking away in our own little space, basically pulling a lot of methods from 18F and USDS because we looked at, at what was out there, different commercial libraries, we looked at spinning up our own thing from whole cloth, and I'm like, you know, none of this is really gonna actually get us uh, as much as using the 18F USDS stuff just because so many of the constraints are really similar, right? A lot of the focus on accessibility and other things. So like, Design system stuff is super long term, 
right? Because like the goal for that is that um, we'll end up at some point hopefully tying that to the procurement process. So we're giving people very clear guidelines of like, this is what accessibility is, and this is how you implement it. And if you don't like do the equivalent, like that's okay. You can like roll your own system if you want, but this is a system that has as much kind of goodness baked into it to get you some of that stuff from the get go, right? So it's kind of a longer term thing. 311 is happening pretty much in real time. Like we're gonna deliver this by the end of the year, or early next year. So <clears throat> it's a classic case of like, hey, we're flying the plane. We just figured out we need wings. Let's figure out which wings we can put on. So what we're doing is we're basically taking a lot of the stuff that's in the design system, standards, things that exist in the city, checking them, casting them, putting it into the design system, using the design system then to inform the 301 product suite. So it won't be perfect, because right, it never is, because you've got just a bunch of juggling priorities happening at the same time. Um, but the goal is that if we architect a lot of the 311 stuff correctly, then it should be able to pull from and continuously inherit from the design system. And so we should be able to see those updates over time. All right, um, we have time for one more question. We're gonna take it from the doc here. Um, and the question is, what are some of the lessons learned from the City of Chicago Open Data Portal that your team has been or will be leveraging? Oh yeah, that's a good one. <clears throat> so Open Data Portal, well, I mean, just first of all, the fact that it exists, right? And just the notion that we should work in the open and that we should work in basically an API-driven manner where the stuff in the data portal drives both internal and external products, I think is super key. And that's a lot of the same kind of stuff we wanna do with the design system. Like, very specifically, uh, I'm not here to be the new Tom because those are really big shoes to fill and I could never do it right. Um, but we're definitely gonna steal a whole bunch of his playbook. And I think one of the pieces of it is, how do we work in the public, with the public, as much as we can to get these things working? And not just working on like side things that we do over here, little microsites or whatever, but no, like the design system stuff we're doing is gonna drive all the city websites and products and services over time, right? It also could be a resource that's usable by a lot of other folks in a lot of other situations where they want a civic tech product that looks good and works well and feels like Chicago. So what we're hoping for there is that there is similar collaboration, similar community, um, which is why we've released everything we're doing in the public domain. Thanks for having me. Thank you.